We're here with Jerry Cohen. He's the professor of ecology and evolution at the University of Chicago. How are you doing today? Fine, thanks. Thank, uh, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Um, so just, we'll, we'll jump right in. What do you think um, of the need to defend evolution to non-experts? Well, clearly there is a need, especially in my country where 46% of Americans don't even believe in evolution. They're young earth creationists. Another 30% or so are theistic evolutionists, i.e. they think God did it. And right. only 15% of Americans, which is between one in six and one in seven, really accept a naturalistic view of evolution the way we scientists mm -hmm. construe it. So clearly there's a disconnect between what scientists think and what the public thinks. And, you know, um, because of the importance of evolution as a central theme mm -hmm. of biology, and uh, its value, as Richard wrote in his um, latest book, as a sort of source of wonder. Yeah, there's a need for people to appreciate their origins and the origins of other species. And so I've spent a lot of time doing that in the past several decades. No, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, we, we use evolution for uh, medicine, especially antibiotics yeah. and other kind of um, uh, treatments against viruses, I would assume. Uh, you kind of need to understand uh, how things change over time, right? I mean, we have uh, a new flu virus every every year, and we have a new flu vaccine as a result, and we wouldn't know that to some degree if it wasn't for evolution. True, although the, I think there's plenty of creationists who get a flu vaccine every year <laughs> based on that, and they don't understand it. I mean, I think the, you know, the, the practical benefits of evolution, I mean, you've mentioned one or two of them are there, but the value of evolution, I think, is goes far beyond just its price. It's not going to make us rich. It's not going to make us handsome. It will have a marginal effect in medicine and health. I think the main value is, you know, I think what Richard has always emphasized as a the true story of our origins, which is, you know, a, a true myth. And its value in inspiring wonder in people, I think, is far greater than any kind of practical considerations it might have. Uh, what Speaking of, of, of practical considerations, what do you think is the most compelling single piece of uh, evidence for evolution? Oh, I mean, single piece. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, I guess if you're going to ask me what I would present to people, if I could only give right. them one thing, right, right. I would show them the fossil record. Um, because there's nothing like seeing those skulls lined up, and especially in the human lineage from Australopithecus all the way to modern Homo sapiens, um, and dated properly to convince people that, yeah, I mean, maybe we evolved after all. As a scientist, though, I find many of the other lines of evolution equally convincing biogeography, embryology, um, molecular biology, um, the presence of vestigial organs in people, or out, sorry, in other creatures as well. Okay. But there's nothing like actually seeing the bones that convinces the average person. So. Um, how, how? What do you think of, of DNA evidence or presenting DNA evidence uh, to, to say non-experts or those? Well, it depends on what you present. I mean, that's one reason I left that out of my book. You don't find in my book why evolution is true. You won't find anything about DNA evidence. Um, it's sort of there. That is, if you sequence the DNA of organisms, you can see that the more closely related we think they are evolutionarily, the more close their DNA is in sequence. So we're closest to chimpanzees and then gorillas and orangutans. But if you're a creationist, you could argue, well, you know, God made us all and the, the organisms that are the most similar have the most similar DNA because after all, that's the basis for the way they're made. So that the argument for similarity of DNA reflecting similarity of ancestry, I don't think it's particularly compelling. That's why I like things like the fossil record in biogeography, where there is no alternative <laughs> creationist explanation. That said, there are aspects of molecular biology which are absolutely convincing of evolution. And one of those is the fact that the, sim the sequence similarity between um, species is not only in the DNA that actually makes stuff, but in the so-called junk DNA, which doesn't do anything. Sure. So if it's just reflecting God's way of making creatures, and yet we have this DNA which doesn't do anything, but it still shows a time-dependent change that absolutely mirrors what evolutionists tell us is the ancestry, that's pretty strong evidence for evolution. But it's hard to explain something like sure. that for to the average person, as opposed to look at these human skulls. You know? Well, it's uh, I, when you know when we say non-experts, um, we, we really we're really talking about people that don't believe. I mean, there's there's plenty of non-experts that believe or accept evolution. Yeah, um, and I would assume that something as complex as trying to explain DNA yeah. might be a little challenging. You know, yeah, you, there's there are certain things that you have to be uh, educated to the degree that you are 
sometimes just to explain some of these things. Yeah. Is that is that kind of what we're saying as far as you know if we're going to try and explain evolution to them, we yeah. should stick with things that are uh, at least a little simpler, at least more tangible. Yeah, I think so. I mean, but there are so many simple things that. I mean, I just listed six or seven lines okay. of evidence that support evolution, and all of those are in my book as a separate chapter, and they're they're certainly within the grasp of any literate sure. person that has any interest in evolution at all. So there's no really need. I mean, you're just piling on more and more <laughs> esoteric <laughs> when yeah. you go into stuff like DNA sequences. <laughs> but you know, if you look at like the fossils, uh, biogeography, which I find extremely convincing, um, and embryology. Um, the presence of vestigial organs, things like that. Um, to, I mean, those those are very disparate areas, and yet they all are evidence for evolution. So that should convince anybody. You don't need to add any more than that. Sure. I mean, in, in all those different, uh, or except the the geo, uh, the geography, mm -hmm. uh, the embryology, and so on. That's all dependent on DNA. So you don't. It, it's almost like you don't even have to say it because it's implied. Yeah. Is, is in the in the foundation. True. Of other it's things. a similarity of developmental program, but. I mean, the evidence for evolution, I mean, is w from embryology is where organisms actually, in their development, develop something that then goes away again. Like, and like, uh, like our gills. Yeah, our, well, the gill slits, so the well, brachial arches that we develop. Also, the coat of hair that we develop as an embryo at six months that then is shed. I mean, there's just no way to understand that except as a remnant of our primate ancestry that's transitorily expressed. Yeah, so. or, or God does things in very inefficient, silly yeah. ways. <laughs> well, I, but it has to be, I mean, it, you know, this is what creationists respond. They say things, like, well, you know, God's not perfect. He could have a bad day. He could have imperfections. My answer to that would be that those imperfections are precisely the imperfections you expect if evolution were true. <laughs> I mean, we don't develop a coat of hair. Reptiles don't develop a coat of hair in the, in the womb. Well, or they don't have a womb, but in the yeah. egg. And, but we do. Why is that? Because our closest... Um, relatives and our ancestor was hairy so you know if God just screwed up and put hair in an embryo that doesn't need hair because it's floating in warm liquid well you know that's just it's just remarkably coincidental yeah, right. so.